Hey, Shane here from Shane Smith Law. We're here today at Mind Matters, navigating head injuries and concussions. I'm here with Thomas from the Concussion and Brain Injury Group here at Shane Smith Law, and we're gonna be talking about youth sports safety, basically. If you heard on one of our prior podcasts, we talked about the NFL concussion safety protocol. Now we're gonna be talking about how it sort of trickles down into youth sports. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shane. It's uh, really important to keep having these conversations, especially when we're talking about concussions and youth sports. Uh, and I know that's become a bigger thing over and, you know, repeatedly it becomes a bigger thing. I think we're just, I don't think they're more frequent. I think it's just more aware of it. Absolutely. And today, you know, we're focusing on concussions. It's a increasingly concerning issue as our young athletes get bigger, faster, and stronger. <laughs> I was going to say, I think, I think that is documented that the athlete, the kids are bigger and stronger nowadays, or, or maybe training's better or nutrition's better. I mean, all of that, but they're, they're hitting harder than they used to, right? Definitely, definitely. I think uh, we're seeing that charted out in lots of different ways all across society. Um, I think one of the biggest issues when we're looking at youth sports and concussions is the second impact uh, syndrome. What is that and why do we need to worry about it? Uh, so sudden impact sy uh, syndrome occurs when an athlete suffers a second concussion before the first one that they had has fully healed. This can lead to catastrophic outcomes including cerebral swelling or even death. It can be pretty rare, but when it does happen, the mortality rate is about 90%. Holy cow. Terrifying. I mean, so that's awful for our kids. And unfortunately, it's not like there's a red light, green light, right? That says you're totally healed and now you're not. I mean, that statistic is scary as can be. I mean, it's hard to really, I mean, even think about that. I mean, because all the kids in sports, but it's not just numbers. I mean, these are real kids, real people. I think there was Chad Stover's case out in Missouri uh, this year. What happened there? Yeah, Chad Stover, he was a high school football player who sustained a brain injury during a playoff game. He was hospitalized and tragically passed away two weeks later. And that kind of started to underscore the dire need for immediate and cautious handling of any head injury that happens on the field. And, and obviously we know big game. I'm sure he had pressure, wanted to play. I'm sure his family wanted him to play coach. I mean, obviously nobody wanted this to happen. Uh, but but he's not the only one that happened this year, right? I mean, didn't uh, someone get injured in uh, Arizona as well? Yeah, there was a, a young man, Charles Uvella from Arizona. Uh, another heartbreaking story. Uh, he was tackled and his head hit the back of the, the ground uh, really hard. He stayed in the game for two more plays, but then collapsed and passed away three days later. Just a, another poignant reminder of why athletes need to be removed from play immediately after a head injury. Which is I mean, why the whole NFL concussion protocol came up, right? Right, exactly. Just looking at these tragedies and trying to find a way to prevent them from happening because it's a, it's a tough thing to know when, when one of these things has happened sometimes. Now, I know the kids, just like professional athletes, they want to play. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to sit on the bench and rarely does somebody want to... I mean, even for medical reasons, everybody wants to play, right? Yeah, you just feel like you've done something wrong if you're not out there with the same. Yeah. <laughs> and I know you were telling me before, too, there was another child, another one. What was Damon Janes? Yeah, Damon Janes. He uh, lost consciousness after a helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision. You know, one of those big things you always see when you're watching on TV. Oh, helmet-to-helmet, -helmet, immediate flag. People are like, oh, that wasn't that bad. But here, you know, Damon, helmet-to-helmet -helmet collision, got rushed to the hospital and died a few days later. And... Uh, you look at that, you look at the protocols that have come into place, you know, his tragic death shows the need for strict protocols and immediate action after a suspected concussion. And in all of these cases, did everybody know they'd had the prior concussion? In Charles' case where he hit the back of his head on the ground and suffered a concussion, yeah. you know, played two, in two other plays and, you know, he had suffered the concussion on the first hit and then essentially got dinged up again gotcha. on the second one, and that, that was what took him. And so the biggest issue is not so much, I had a concussion on Monday, I think I'm okay, I'm gonna go play a week or two weeks later. It's when they have a, a super hard hit where a concussion is likely, and they're not pulled off the field or evaluated for the concussion, it's just sort of the, you doing okay, you're okay kind of deal, back into play, is that? Yeah, it's, you know, having the the wherewithal the spotters on the field a staff that's identified to see the signs of a concussion to get someone off the field because this can happen like that it's it's not like the concern is is weeks or days down the road it the concern is immediately after this case yeah this point this, this this 10 minute chunk of life when we don't deal with these we see the tragic consequences you know which is i mean these kids lives are cut super short what are the assessments i, mean, I know the nfl has done their, they have their concussion protocols what are, what do we got in youth sports? Yeah, there's 
several measures that have been put in place or several things that we can do at the youth sports level to prevent tragedies like this. First, an obvious answer is education, you know, it's your education awareness, but coaches, players, parents being informed about the signs of, a con of concussions and the risks of returning to play too soon. So it's not something that's brushed under the rug or thought to be insignificant. So that's kind of the first step from there. You would think about access to medical professionals like athletic trainers or neurologists at games and practices that can make a significant difference in immediate concussion assessment and management. I think the key, like you talk about is coaches, right? I mean, coaches and assistant coaches or somebody on the team paying attention. And like in the army, you, on a range, you can, anybody can call safety issue and get everybody stopped. Now it doesn't happen often, but something out on the field, I guess, to say, hey, let's slow down and pay attention. This kid got hit really hard. Yeah. How do we balance balance this out, right? I mean, obviously, sports has tremendous benefits to children, um, to youth, you know, their development and responsibility and all those things. How do we balance that versus, you know, the risks of injury? It's one of those hard decisions that I think every family has to make because, you know, with every increase in safety, you have you know, an increase in, you know, I guess you could say freedom, you know, in people's ability to participate in, uh, you know, different things that they want to participate in, because nothing can be completely safe, right? So, you know, it's it's one of these things where if we have responsible participation by the different individuals who have a stake in all this, then you can assess things as they go and, and start to, if there's responsible management of the process and responsible look and education about what the significance of concussion for a young athlete can do. You know, it, it would mean maybe some more expense, maybe some more care taken, but I think that's a way that you can start to balance it. Because, I mean, you could put everybody in bubble wrap and, you know, everything would be really safe, but then everybody would be wearing bubble wrap. And I know from the youth perspective, usually they're very resistant to any new stuff. And I can remember when bicycle helmets became new and thinking, I didn't need a bicycle helmet when I was a kid. I mean, we, we jumped, we did all kind of stuff with no helmets and then it shifted over. But I, I even remember that was seatbelts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was all this resistance to seatbelts. So uh, I'm aware of the balancing aspect it, and, and we don't want to coddle our kids, but we, we also don't want to put them at unnecessarily risk. For me, it seems like, like you say, some kind of culture of, hey, awareness out on the field and I don't know who should play that role. The NFL has kind of led the way to an extent with its visibility in terms of improving their protocols. Yeah. You know, which we talked about before with sideline neurologists, in-game monitoring. On the other hand, with youth sports, you know, you don't always have a large governing body, you know, that's responsible for all, you know, s travel teams, recreational sports, uh, school sports. You don't really have that kind of governing body that you have with the NFL that measures, you know, the biggest game in the world. And you don't have the money either, they right? I mean, I mean, I know a lot of rural programs or small small schools, they don't have any budget to do it. So I mean, it's, it's like, how do you do this, right? It's hard enough to get equipment to play football. I, I mean, you have pads, you have helmets, you have, there's a, a lot of things that, you know, soccer, all you need is a ball. You, know, you don't need shoes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a much more expensive sport. So youth sports, particularly with football, you know, they're lacking these comprehensive measures that, and that leaves decisions like this in the hands of non-medical personnel like coaches, which can be problematic. I mean, we've probably, I've, I've had a coach in the past, oh yeah, you just got your bell rung, get back out get there. Get back in there. Well, that certainly if you have a coach who has been around a long time, I mean, that was sort of the prevailing model right if you can get up and run and you say you're good to go you're good to go right yeah. i mean that uh, that's sort of how we grew up i mean i'm thinking about even in martial arts and all, you know all of that i mean it, it kicked to the head is you're good you back out on the field which is what they were doing here. they do here yeah has the government done anything have they come up with any programs to encourage the safety and awareness out throughout the high schools i know the cdc did some stuff yeah so there, there's been some uh some frameworks both legally and policy wise that have been established at state and national levels when we talk about clear enforceable guidelines those can support coaches and organizations in making the right decisions for their athletes health in terms of specific programs we've got the cdc's heads up uh concussion and youth sports initiative and also USA Football's Heads Up pro, uh, football program. How are these helping, I guess, coaches at the high school level or, or even younger? Yeah, so this is the example of a you know, government uh, entity taking the initiative to educate coaches, parents, and athletes about concussions and youth sports, comprehensive sort of vision with it. It's For the CDC, it's something that provides resources to help recognize, respond to, 
and minimize the risk of concussions. One of the key components there is educating the different stakeholders on the signs and symptoms of concussions. And part of that is ensuring that anyone with a suspected concussion is immediately removed from play. And I know that's, like we've talked about, that's super tough for a coach. I mean, your star player, you know, takes a hard hit. I know you want to err on the side of caution. Nobody wants anybody to get hurt, but you also want to win. I mean, so are these programs, are they pushing out, hey, these are all the signs and symptoms of a concussion. This is everything you need to be looking for to sort of make it simple or, or I don't want to say dumb it down, but I mean, simplify the process. So I'm like, oh, you got some warning signs. It's putting some of what we know and what the NFL has implemented out there for in terms of having resources for people and, and getting out there and raising awareness around, about it. Um, one of the biggest challenges implementing these guidelines at a grassroots level yeah. because like you said there's rural, rural areas there's you know all these counties all over the country that have different levels of you know of programs right yeah I programs mean, some, some have no but I mean some have a coach and that's it and sometimes the coach is a volunteer even yeah I mean so They're getting paid anything so they don't have any money so I mean making it easy for them to identify and say okay hold on we need to slow down is really what's needed out there, right? Yeah, and then, and then you talk about awareness. Yeah, awareness is great, but if you don't have any action, I mean, what's awareness worth? It's like, oh, well, I know about it, but what am I going to actually do about it? If we have that awareness, we have to make sure that awareness is getting translated into action, like having a proper medical evaluation or adherence to those return to play protocols. And that's a hurdle. And, and you know, just sitting here thinking about it, I mean, it seems like the referee bodies would be a good area to, to push it down to, because they're supposed to be neutral, right? I mean, and, and it, uh, I hate to say it, but it seems like everybody hits the ref anyway. At least yeah. when they make calls, you know, calls against your team, it seems like that might be an opportunity. You know, another area instead of just the coaches who have a vested interest in their team playing. You know, maybe the refs have the ability to I don't know do a medical hold or something on it. I don't know if that's yeah. something anybody's looked at or not. Yeah, maybe put another one on the field like a independent, you know, similar to what they have in the, in the NFL with an independent evaluator. But let's put a ref on the field who's in there close to the huddle like some of the other ones are just keeping an eye on things that that could certainly be something that you would think would be effective and i'm hopefully fairly cheap that's yeah, what yeah. i was thinking about for you know poor coaches now we talked a little bit about some of the other programs i know usa football's got a heads up football program what's that about yeah it's uh this program by usa football it focuses specifically on the sport of football and it aims to make the game safer by educating coaches on proper tackling techniques equipment fitting and of course, concussion recognition and response protocols. This is a more targeted approach, and it includes certification for coaches, and it emphasizes safer play through education and practice. And it's a partnership with the NFL, so it, that gives it more visibility and resources, but like the CDC initiative that we talked about, it focuses heavily on awareness and education without having these clear actionable tools for actually putting these things into practice. So you have a gap there again between knowledge and action. And it sounds like some of the focus on this is on prevention of concussions by teaching better and safer tackle protocols, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's funny, I was actually talking to one of my kids and they were talking about they had an old school football coach wrestling who done wrestling. So they taught them to tackle differently than one of the other coaches had done, which after talking to him is actually a safer way, which sounds like, I mean, I don't want to give him credit for it. I don't want to do, but it sounds exactly like what this program is trying to teach the coaches to do. Yeah, I think you can even see it in the name of it too. You know, the heads up, you know, you don't want to tackle with your head down. That's where you see a lot of the injuries happen. It's like leading with your head, you know, keeping your head up, kind of leading with your shoulder. And, you know, when you talk about that, it's uh, it, it's it's a good, I don't want to say it's a good, easy way, but it, it takes takes away the... I've got to make the call, does he have a concussion or not? Let me pull him out because we're teaching safer fundamentals to still do the sport everybody loves. Exactly, yeah. Keeping, starting at the ground level, it's it's building up those practices the right way. Uh, we talked about targeted education and practice. That seems like the key, key things to this program and any other program as implementation. Um, have they been successful? Do we have any data on that? Well, so there's evidence to suggest that education and proper tackling techniques can reduce the risk of concussions. But again, the success of these depends on, these heavily depends on consistent and universal adoption across teams and leagues. And, you know, I don't know that we have a lot of data on that is, you know, we have all these leagues and then actually having it implemented and then reported back to yeah. a data collecting 
and, and, for instance. And it's hard to disprove a negative, right? You didn't have a concussion, so everything went well. But it's also, it would seem like then if we push out all this education on how to identify concussions, you know, the rate of concussions is going to spike in all the games, but not because it's any worse, but just because we're identifying it and responding to it appropriately. So this encourages anybody to do it because now suddenly we're an unsafe or it's dangerous. Yeah, it almost it creates a false perception of what's going on. It's like you hear with the news, people are like, oh, there's so many tornadoes, there's so much all this bad stuff going on all over the world. Right. It's like, well, we have 50 different news channels. and Right, nothing changed, so we're just reporting it more. <laughs> yeah, everybody has Same a, with the concussions. Yeah. Everybody has a news camera in their hand now, and yeah, so yeah. <laughs> of course there's gonna be more because we have more visibility of it. Right, so, all right, so we, we, we know they are pushing these programs out. We know uh, USA Football has got the Heads Up program. You know, it seems like the only way for it to work is, like you say, adoption uh, throughout all the leagues, consistency, pushing this over and over. But we don't know how we're going to get any data, basically. I mean, or how we don't really know how it's going to be effective or not, other than, I guess, less of these tragic deaths. Is that right? Yeah, it's, you know, we got to ask where are we seeing those those gaps between the concussions being management managed and, and having prevention. And one of the things you can see with all that is, like, even if we had the data and it all the way across, the board in terms of it being reported, like what are we going to do about having immediate on-field medical response? You know, there's not the resources you think at youth level, yeah. every high school game across the country to have medical professionals there at games, and not just games, but at practices. Yeah, I was going to say practice is a whole nother can of worms, right? Because right. I mean, even at a game, you say you've got to have an ambulance or something, which I've seen at some, some games. Are you going to make a, a ambulance be at every practice? I mean, that pretty soon it seems like some of these less less wealthy counties, and they just have to close down the program. Yeah, yeah, you don't have the resources, so it's so well. We've got you don't want to choke out the goodness of the game and and the goodness of sport by having too many regulations. But at the same time, it's so well. How how do we figure out something like a compromise? How do we bridge this gap? Um, we just need more objective tools in terms of. Perhaps just having people screen on the sidelines or on the team to have these sideline concussion evaluations that can su support those without medical training. Right. So at least it would be like, check, check, check. Up. Oh, looks like you're good to go. At least there's some assessment, some evaluation by somebody Yeah. to encourage you to slow down a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Key takeaways you would give to uh, coaches, parents uh, around this area? What would you say? Yeah, I think... Just the, it's the importance of education, proper training, and having clear, actionable protocols in place, and creating a culture of safety where the well-being of the athlete is paramount. Not hey, you know, winning some Pop Warner, you know, quarterfinal game. It's let's think about you know little Timmy. Five, ten, fifteen years from today. yeah, and the person he's going to be and the life he's going to have, and everyone who's involved in youth sports whether it's coaches parents leagues and the athletes themselves they all play a role in making it safer but advocating for the resources and policies that best support the best practices of concussion management and prevention that's crucial it's just getting everybody to buy in getting everybody to realize the issue and just go with it and, and you know obviously we're, we're highly concerned about concussions and, and brain injuries because that's what we see every day and we talk to people who suffered you know, serious concussions and brain injuries. And so we talk to them or their families and they've got personality changes and the long-term impacts. And that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, you're so passionate about, hey, parents need to take at least take a look at this and, and understand a little bit. Nobody wants to get rid of football. We just want the kids to be safe, right? Yeah, you see people's lives transformed. They're one person one day and then the next they're somebody who nobody even recognizes not even themselves i don't know the person who i've become but i know it happened because of this brain injury i sustained and you think about the tragedy of that happening to a child i know thomas we're super passionate about it because we spend all day looking at concussions and brain injuries and we talk to families of people who've had brain injuries and and one of the things they say is that personalities change and all that what do your clients say about that yeah when you think about what happens to someone when they have a brain injury and they talk about everyone around me, they think I'm a different person, and I even think I'm a different person in terms of you know, who I am before this happened and who I am after the brain injury. Seeing that transformation and seeing the devastation that it does to the life of the person it affects and everyone around them, and then you think about that happening to a young boy or a young girl, you know, Timmy or you know, Josie, whoever it may be, and think about what was taken from them and what could have been prevented with just 
a little bit more care and a little bit more attention to the lives of you know the most innocent among us and uh so that's that's what i'm passionate about it's like making sure that things that are tragic and life-changing if we have a way to prevent them and keep them from happening that we do everything we can to do that i think that's you know one of the duties that we have without taking away from the joy of the sport right i mean yeah. it's like helmets didn't destroy bicycles right right i mean or you know or yeah. having to wear a helmet while you ride a motorcycle doesn't make it not fun um and they still do all the kind of things on bi regular bicycles that they used to do i think and uh, they're just safer and they wear a helmet and yeah, we don't less deaths. We don't have to regulate sports to death. We don't have to become overly, you know, hands on. Control yeah. yeah, control free. But all it takes is a little bit in terms of a little, yeah, ounce of prevention is worth, you know, 10 pounds of cure in this instance. It's just taking a little bit more time, focusing on what's important, and that's the lives of our children. That's, uh, that's all we need. Uh, so, Thomas, thanks for being on the show today. I know we talked about uh, youth football today, and I think we're uh, in another episode we're going to be talking about how it impacts other sports, particularly soccer I know is on the list. For anybody out there, uh, this is Mind Matters, Navigating Head Injuries and Concussions. If uh, you enjoy this, hit like and subscribe, and hit the bell down below for notifications. And remember, if you're in pain, call Shane, 980-999-9999. Nine, 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 nine,